So let's work on it together. Let's start here. Electrons, where are they located? Okay, so we can go outside. Protons? Inside. Inside what? Nucleus. Nucleus. So really what I would just do is say nucleus for these. And neutrons? Nucleus. Okay, the important part about this location is going to come to the next kind of descriptor, which I don't think we walked through in this class. Uh, if I asked you to describe my size, how would you describe it? Height, 6'2", going to the height, quantifying it. Nice. And of course, everyone's going to dodge the other one. Come on, there's another descriptor of size. Okay, weight. Okay, so we have two ways that we could describe size. We've got the mass and kind of the height. When we're looking at atomic structure, we want to do something similar. We want to look at the weight and the height of the atom. Okay, because the atoms are circular, we don't really get height, so we can reference the radius. Okay. <clears throat> Which of those particles is going to contribute to the height of the atom? Where are the protons and neutrons found? Inside the nucleus. Inside the nucleus. If the atom was the superdome, where's the nucleus? A marble. Are you going to tell me the marble is going to dictate the size of the superdome? Not quite. It's actually going to be our electrons. So our electrons are what's dictating the height, if you will, for the most part, of an atom. Okay, so when we talk about size, that's what I'm referencing, is the height, okay, electrons. If I now ask what dictates the mass, you could say the protons and neutrons, okay? Why the protons and neutrons? Just because they're inside the nucleus doesn't mean they're contributing to mass. Electrons are outside the nucle nucleus. Don't electrons have mass? Yeah. So why are we saying the protons and neutrons contribute to mass? What is that relative mass? Okay. We have one as our relative mass for both the protons and neutrons. What's the relative mass for electrons? Zero. It's effectively zero. Okay. Those of you that memorize that weird thousand number, stop. Zero. Okay. Charge. Way to qualify it, our electrons are negative. Protons are positive. And our neutrons are zero. Okay. Symbols? E negative. E negative. P positive. And zero. And zero. Now to the, in my opinion, hardest question on here, the meaning. We didn't do the meaning yet, did we? We didn't. Good. So it should be a harder question. I'm going to make the argument that the easiest of those three to answer is protons. What is the meaning of a proton? Kind of a hard question, so let's rephrase it a little bit. I give you one proton. What can you tell me? Hydrogen. You can tell me it's hydrogen. If I give you two protons, you can tell me? Helium. Helium. What are you telling me? It's defining the element. So the number of protons dictate our element. Okay. What if I tell you you have hydrogen with one electron? Doesn't it be reactivity? Reactivity is a little bit too vague for us, and we haven't talked about reactivity yet at all. So I'm on a pan on that and say no. It's neutral. It's neutral. What if it had no electrons? If it has two electrons? Negative. negative. What are you specifying when you're talking about that positive, negative, and neutral? The charge. The charge. So the number of electrons define? The charge of the atom. The charge of the atom. Okay. It is a balance of protons and electrons. But once I've established what the protons are, those can't change. The electrons are now going to be variable to change the charge. Make sense? Yeah. Neutrons? The mass. Now we're going to define the mass. 
Hi. With those in mind, that's how we then go through and now apply that information out to a lot of different areas. Right? So if we have a solid understanding here, it's now just a question of applying. If we don't have a solid understanding here, we have to memorize these facts and then memorize more facts further on down the road. Okay? If your brain can deal with memorization of that many facts, phenomenal, do it. If it can't, start thinking about how you can tie it back to simpler features. This is as simple as we go. Make sense? Okay. Mm, let's just kind of chat it out. Name of, uh, let's write it down. You write it down on a piece of paper and then we'll, then we'll do some potential shouting it out. I'll give you a couple minutes. Not turn in, so I know you just tore something off. Don't turn it in. Okay, sorry. Uh, for the record, if there's an actual quiz that I want you to turn in, I'm going to give you a little sheet of paper. Can I talk to him? Name of a famous chemist or physicist that contributed to the understanding of atomic structure. Rutherford. Rutherford. What did Rutherford get us? The current atomic model. I'll accept that. Current atomic model, Rutherford. What else could you tie to him? Mary Curie, I'm going to say, is a separate scientist, so don't tie her necessarily to that. She has her own discoveries. I still want Rutherford. We've got Rutherford, current atomic model. The nucleus. nucleus. How do you do it? Alpha particle is going to be a tricky one. You're right. It's a tricky one because that ties to Curie. Okay, so we want to be a little bit careful with that one. Gold foil. Right, so we're picking out keywords to tie to each of those kind of concepts. That's going to be important because that's what you could expect to see on a test question. Make sense? Maybe it'll come. There it goes. Uh, I heard Curie first. What do you have on Curie? Perfected the refinement of radioactive materials. Right, that's pretty much the big one for her. We could also go, she's female. Right, that's part of the, the she aspect. Uh, two Nobel Prizes you could throw in there. Okay, but for the most part, it's that purification of radioactive materials. Uh, and then I think I heard Thompson. Yeah. What do we have on Thompson? Uh, electrons. electrons. How? Not the oil drop, which is an important <coughs> Phrase. We'll have to come back to that. He did the yeah. cathode ray tube and vacuum are going to be the big things to tie to him. Okay. We heard oil drop experiment. What did the oil drop experiment do? It found the mass of charge. The charge on an electron. We don't care what the number is, but we found the formal charge on an electron. And who was it? Millikan and Fletcher. Get the right idea? Anybody else have another name you wanted to throw into the, the mix? Chadwick? What was Chadwick? The existence of a neutron is really what I would push on that. I would just put Chadwick with neutron. I just remember that thing about like, the process started and then Rutherford was a group Chadwick was Rutherford group. Yep. So they're all kind of interlinked there. Kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Topic to be discussed at any point forward. So we won't put anybody on the spot on this, but why might I ask that question? Are you being an active student and preparing ahead for each of the classes? Okay. This is a good thing that you should be doing. Right? If you're not and you're not doing well on exams, it's probably a good idea to start doing that. Just kind of a heads up. Okay, last one, an isotope was isolated with 88 protons, 138 neutrons. The atomic notation for this element. What is our atomic notation? Um, Start with you. What do you want to give me? Well, the first thing is to find the element that it is. You have to add the two numbers together because it's a combination of. Okay, so to define the element, we would need to add the protons and Actually, the no, no, neutrons. No, just kidding. No, no, this is based off the protons. Sorry, I was thinking of something. Okay, so to define the element, literally just walked through it, it's the number of protons. Yeah. So the number of protons here is 88, which would be what element? Ra. A nice cop-out. I like it. For? 
Radium. Okay. We've addressed the 88. Where would the 88 show up in our atomic notation? The bottom left. Opposite of how it's organized on the periodic table. Okay. Because different meanings behind why we would use each of those notations. So what shows up in the upper left? The combination of the protons and neutrons. I can't do that math. Thank you for having done that for me. 226, bless you. Make sense? Okay. Why would I ask a question about this element? Mary Curie. Yeah, ties back to stuff that she did work on. It was radium. Okay. So, just to get you thinking about things. So now let's take a look at our isotopes, which is really just a fancy way, iso meaning same, and tope tying back to the idea of type. So when we talk about isotopes, we're saying same type. Same type what? Same type of element. So I'm going to take a look at hydrogen as a type of element. All right, and we've got two notations shown below. Okay. Our symbol is H because it's hydrogen. Lower left-hand corner, we have the protons. number of protons, also known as the atomic number. atomic number. It's the same in both cases, which makes sense because we're still using H as our symbol. And then in the upper left-hand corner, what are we showing? The mass number. So for this first symbol that we're looking at, that for whatever reason has this weird protium name next to it, how many neutrons does it have? I'm being a jerk, it's not one, it's zero. If there was one neutron, add that to the proton, the number becomes two. This one has one neutron, okay? So be careful with that. So what is in the nucleus for this particular isotope? A single proton, what else? Nothing. That's it. It's a single proton. What might be a fancy name that I could use for this? Proteum, in reference to what's in its nucleus. Okay. Why don't I call it hydrogen? Well, it turns out hydrogen with just one proton is common enough, okay, but not universally accept not accepted, universally present that there are other forms of hydrogen. So if I'm going to refer to hydrogen of a mass unit of one, or mass number of one, I'm going to invent a new name for it so I can distinguish it from the other forms. The reason we're doing this is that it's common enough and studied enough. Most elements have different forms of different masses. That doesn't mean we name them independently. They aren't all equally studied, so we don't invent a new name for each of them. Kind of make sense? Hydrogen is special for that reason, so we can call it protium for that first one. What happens when I move to the other one? Well, I need a new name. I could call it protium 2. The 2 could carry multiple meanings, so we have to make an adjustment. Okay, we could call it, as I came up with earlier this morning, because what's in the nucleus here? proton and a neutron, I could call it pronudium. That was a pretty legit name, I thought. Right? Yeah, fine. Is this on? Sorry. What do we call it? Deuterium. Deuterium. Oh, gee, I'm in Christmas. Deuterium for? Duo. Duo or deuce because? Two. There's two things in its nucleus. Okay. What we are referencing here is more commonly known as the same type but different mass. Okay. We can call those isotopes. Okay. Every element has the potential for isotopes. Okay. That does not mean every element's isotopes are commonly found or are populous enough for us to actually be able to do anything with. Okay. Hydrogen happens to have two relatively common ones. Okay. What is the mass for protium? 
One. What is the mass for deuterium? Two. Two. So if I wanted to determine the mass for all my hydrogen samples, what could I possibly do? I could add the two up. So you're just going to say the mass of all hydrogen is, is three? Divide by two. Why? What did you just do? You found the average. You calculated a simple average. Right? So what we did is we said one plus two, because those were the masses that we were looking at, and then we divided it all by the total number in our sample, which in this case is two divided by two, and we would get a mass of One point five. Okay. That would now be the average mass for hydrogen for all isotopes of hydrogen, making the assumption that protium and deuterium are the only ones present. Okay. Is the mass number found on the periodic table? No. What's found on the periodic table? The average mass. What did we just calculate? The average mass. So for hydrogen, I would expect the mass on the periodic table to be 1.5. And it is 1.01. totally not. What did we screw up? In this calculation, we made the assumption that we have 50% protium and 50% deuterium. That's not true. And when we look at this, we're like, well, I don't see that assumption. How is that factored in there? Because it is. Okay, so let's play around with some mathematics, because mathematics playing is always fun. Okay, let's switch this around. Plus. Yeah? Does everybody agree with that? One half plus two over two. Is that the same as one plus two over two? Yes, right? And we aren't doing this weird, like, math that isn't true. Like, this is legitimate math that is true. Okay? So I'm now going to convert that 1 over 2 to be 1 over 2 times 1. Plus, what do you guys think? 1 over 2 times 2. 1 over 2 is really just half. You mean 50 out of 100? What is 50 out of 100 known as? Yeah, we can go with 0.5. I would make another argument for this. Okay, and this is where it's going to get a little weird. So I'm going to fish for terms and hope this works. What does this line mean? You're going to say division. Give me something else. Alpha, frac I don't know what alpha meant. Out of. Out of, fair enough, but no, keep going. Ratio. Keep going. Percent. I'm going to argue that that line does not mean percent. It means per one per two. Fifty per hundred. What is another name for hundred? Cent. Cent. What have we calculated here? Fifty per Cent. Fifty percent. We just made the assumption through our simple calculation that it was fifty percent the first one, fifty percent the other one. It's embedded in the mathematics. Okay? Our simple average is a complex average. We just decided to ignore the complexities behind it. Okay? We built what is known as an algorithm to hide the actual calculations. This is something that some students get irritated with me for. I do not work on algorithms. Okay? I work on the process built behind them. You can do algorithms out your yin-yang if you want. Okay? And I'll help you kind of piece it together if you would like outside of class. But what we're going to talk about in class is the origin behind where they come from. Okay? And the reason for that is an algorithm is just punching things into a calculator. Guess who can punch things into a calculator? Anyone. Anyone. If I train you how to function with an algorithm, when you leave this class, 
What do you have? An algorithm. You have an algorithm that you can't apply anywhere else. Or someone further up the food chain is going to be like, I can pay a two-year-old a lollipop to do the exact same thing as you're doing. Okay? If I teach you algorithms, I've taught you how to not have a job the rest of your life. Okay? If I teach you the process behind that algorithm, you can find your own algorithms. You can be the one generating algorithms and now paying two-year-olds lollipops okay? and making tons more money. Does that make sense? We want to know the process behind things. That makes it more of a struggle to get through because we have to dig at why things function. Okay? So there's our calculation, and it shows our assumption. That assumption is invalid. Okay? As a ballpark, hydrogen is roughly 99% protium. Deuterium makes up roughly 1%. How do I change my calculation to get an appropriate atomic mass? Where are my percentages in that calculation? The 50s. So that first 50 should become 99, because it's 99%, 99 over 100. So I get 90, let's try and write with not an eraser. What's the next one? 1 over 100. I enter that into the calculator, and what do I get? I was just like, man, I can't do that in my head. That's why we have calculators. That's why you're all supposed to buy calculators. That's why we're all supposed to bring calculators. How many people brought calculators? OK, so fair enough. How many people pulled out calculators to work with in class? OK. So if we pull that out and run that calculation, we get somewhere on the order of 1.1. And if we use that information, what happens when we look at the atomic mass on the periodic table? Hallelujah, there it is. It matches. Beauty. Science. It makes sense. Yeah. That you got those from is like the abundance number, right? Uh huh. So, like, are those going to be given to us or do we just like to know them? Are you going to be expected to memorize the abundance of each of the isotopes? Okay, that's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah for someone saying that's a lot of work, yeah. Okay, we literally just talked about hydrogen. We told you to memorize, let's be on the nice end and just say 12 elements. Okay, hydrogen isn't two isotopes, it actually has three common ones. Right, we'll add the last one in there in a second. Okay. So every element has multiple types of isotopes. They don't all have multiple ones. But let's just say we memorize 10. You now have 20 different things to memorize with their percent abundances. That's going to suck a lot. Okay. So we won't do that. What you will be done, or what will be done, is you'll be given certain aspects of this puzzle and be turned asked to solve it. We have abundances, so let's break this down now, out of numbers and into more kind of a general pseudo-algorithm aspect. Okay? We have the percent of our first thing, because okay? I don't want to use a number, I'm going to use A, times what? What was the one? Okay, this was the mass of A. Depending on what we're doing for a weighted average, it may not be mass, it may be something else. But since we're in chemistry, that's what we're focusing on. It's the mass of that first thing, A. Plus? The percent of B. The percent of B times? The mass of B. The mass of B. Just to be a little bit irritating, why not? Have I reached that threshold yet of irritating enough? No? Okay, so we can be more irritating. Plus? The percent of C. The percent of C. Times the mass of C. Okay, and here's where I'm going to stop being irritating because I'm literally out of space. But we could do plus percent of D times mass of D. Okay. When we add all those up, what do we get? The weighted average of okay. We would get the weighted average. 
Because what we're looking at here is officially for chemistry, the other term that we could call the weighted average in this case would be the, the atomic mass, okay, or the atomic weight. Either is fine. Okay. Based off of the information written in red, is any of that immediately available to you? Yes. What is immediately available to you? The, mass the atomic mass? Yeah. The weighted average atomic mass is immediately available to you. Where is that available to you? It's on the periodic table. As soon as I specify what the element is, you already know the atomic mass. Okay. So you could be given a bunch of information. You may not be told that you need the atomic mass. You'd have to recognize that you can pull that from the periodic table. Okay. So if we go through and look at this, at its simplest level, it's just A and B. So let's just delete the C part. We have one, two, three, four, five things. Okay. You could be asked to solve for any one of those five. Okay. If you're being asked to solve for the atomic mass, what information am I not going to give you? The atomic mass. The name of the, the, name of the element. Because if I ask for the atomic mass and tell you the name of the element, what are you going to do? Look at the periodic table. All of the math was irrelevant. Okay? So if I ask for the atomic mass, you don't get to know the element. Okay? What if I give you percent of A, mass of A, and the mass of B? Okay? And I say for a gallium. You would know the percent of B. How do you know the percent of B? Because we know the percent of A. If there's two isotopes, they must add up to be 100%. So we can limit some of that information. You have to recognize how all of those pieces are interconnected. Kind of, sort of? So, so. OK. We can work with that. So I'm going to delete all that. Are we OK? All right, so let's delete all that. What is the third <coughs> isotope for hydrogen? We add an extra neutron based off the patterning of our names. Tritium. Okay. Does exist. It's not some fictitional thing. Tritium does exist. It's really heavy hydrogen. Okay. How many protons and neutrons does an atom of lead 206 have? So now we've got something switched around on us. So a lot of people are looking at the periodic table. Where in the periodic table does it say lead? Does it say lead? It does not. What are you required to know? The symbol for lead is PB. Okay. What is this 206 in reference to? Okay. It's either going to be the atomic number or it's going to be the mass number, not the atomic mass. This is referring to a specific isotope. If we told you lead and then wrote the atomic number, how useful would that be? What is the atomic number for lead? What does the atomic number mean? Protons. So if I tell you lead, how many protons? 82. What is the 206? It's the mass number. It's the information that would have to be added to that. Once we know it's lead, we know how many protons it is. We have the atomic number. Okay. So we would get our, I already forgot it, 82? 82. 82. Which then means 206 is our mass number. What is the difference between the mass number and the protons or the atomic number? Right. Conveniently written so that we could do the long hand if we wanted to go through and do that. It's almost a 124. And you would be correct because 20 minus 8 is not 16. 
okay? It would be 12, and we get 124, okay? We now know the number of neutrons. Make sense? Okay. So we can write out isotopes in a variety of ways. We can use the atomic notation. We can also use this kind of written out language. Make sense? So percents are unitless information. We just kind of talked about it. Percent, meaning per 100. Okay. How we go through and scaffold and manipulate those shifting decimals, uh, ultimately not that big a deal. But that's where that referencing of what we talked about for the weighted average is what you should be using to figure out and interpret these kind of things. Okay? So if we looked at a quick example, bronze is an alloy of copper and tin. Okay? Bronze contains 79.2 grams of copper and 10.8 grams of tin. What is the percent copper in the bronze? So what do I need to go through and do? So what am I being asked to solve for? The percent copper okay, equals 79.2. I'm going to probably put grams of copper up top. Why would I put grams of copper up top? Because when we said percent of copper, that copper is part of that numerator. Okay, 79.2. Two. Right? All right? What am I going to put underneath it? 79.2 plus 10.8. Right, we got a suggestion to do 79.2 plus 10.8. Why? Because that's the entire mass of the sample where the copper could come from. That is our bronze. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We go through and do that. I did that right. We should get 0 0.88. Is that a percent yet? No, you have to move a I would argue we don't move a decimal. We multiply by oh, yeah. our 100%, and we get our percent unit showing up. OK? Kind of, sort of? So, do you need to show the times 100%? In the case of a show your work question, I would argue all of this information should show up there. That said, this is the first time ever I've been able to write times 100% and not have someone remind me to write it in. Okay. So, writing in the times 100%, not that big a deal. Okay. I would accept that. As long as you didn't tell me your answer was 0.88%. Does that make sense? Okay. Tuesday class, I know, talked something about it. So we're going to put the Tuesday, and by class, I mean the Tuesday lab. So we're going to put the Tuesday lab a bit on the hot seat. Is 88% a correct answer? Why is it wrong? It doesn't have the right significant figures. Okay, for those of you who are like, I'm not in the Tuesday lab, how would I possibly know anything about significant figures? Number one, I posted a video in reference to it in lab so that you could watch that video and be prepared for it when it shows up in lab. Okay. Number two, don't worry about it for the lecture yet. 88, 88.0 will both get equal credit. Make sense? Okay. When we hit unit two, that's when you need to be stressed about sig figs. Right now, you can just be like, what is that? Tell me what the calculator spits out. You're probably OK. We good with that? Do you guys want another thing? Answer the second question? Yeah. Yeah? Do it. Where is that 10.8 grams of tin found? Is it just, ta-da, 10.8 grams of tin? It's found in the bronze. It's found in the bronze. OK, so I accept 10.8 grams of tin, and I like Unit placement there, I'm glad I picked the same measurement system for that. Let's fix that real quickly. That 10.8 grams of tin is found in what? In some mass of? We'll deal with 
the number in a second, some mass of bronze. What is that mass of bronze? Okay, that is the 79.2 plus 10.8. For those of you that were good with math and kept shouting at me 90, you're right, I know. I apologize for not listening to you. I wanted to hear a little more work. Do those two things equal each other? No. No, no. I've got grams of tin, fantastic, exactly where I want it, on top. Grams of bronze doesn't show up in my answer. So something else needs to happen in this calculation. What is that something else? What has to happen? What has to happen to this unit right here? So I heard it has to be in the numerator. Does grams of bronze show up in the answer? No, what has to happen to it? It must cancel. It must disappear. Right? I can't just disappear things. They have to be canceled with something. If grams of bronze shows up in the denominator there, where do I know grams of bronze also must show up? In the numerator. Do I know anything about the grams of bronze for this question? I'm told I'm looking at a 100 gram sample. Now what happens? The grams of bronze cancel. We'll put it over 1. If I punch this into a calculator, do I get an answer? Yes. Do I get a correct answer? Yes. Are there other ways to approach it? Absolutely. Okay. And those are all fair game. Really what I'm trying to do here is set up or kind of foreshadow what we are going to be getting into partially in the second unit. How do we set up a problem to go through and solve for calculations? Because our calculations for this unit are relatively simple and condensed, I don't want to push too much into this except to say that this is a valid way of approaching this. At this stage, you're welcome to use any process you want that gets you there. Make sense? So, simple versus weighted averages. We just walked through kind of the long explanation of this with our hydrogen. Okay. Our weighted average is calculated by multiplying the percentage or weighting of that sample by the value for whatever you're measuring. Okay. And I do that for however many values show up that I need to weight, okay. which is a really fancy way of saying I take what? The percent of A times the mass of A plus the percent of B times the mass of B, so on and so forth, and that then equals our atomic mass, or in this case, more generally, the weighted average. Yeah? This calculation, I think, is a little bit more relevant for us. That's roughly what you need to be able to manipulate and use. We said we were all okay with it on the previous slide when we showed this, right? Yes. Prove it. What is the mass of gallium-71 in AMUs to four significant digits? So all it was was just a question of figuring out where things were. The problem with this is there's lots of similar numbers. I would argue 69 and 71 are very, very close. 69 is also very close to 68.926. These numbers could very easily get confused. So when we went through and referenced it in our general formula, we said percent of A, mass of A, right? So we used A, we used these terms that we could then manipulate a little bit easier. So one thing that I might go through and do for this would be to immediately cross that out and say A. Okay? That means that this mass value belongs to A and that this percent value belongs to A. If I'm getting trigger happy, which sure, why not? Because we always want to solve, we say the percent, 60.11% times our mass, 68.926. Okay. We won't yell about sig figs or units yet, so don't stress there. Okay. Plus, in my formula, what's the next thing i got to write? Percent of B, and I read the question, and there's no blatant percentage given. But we're told that there are two isotopes. 
it means it has to go up to 100%. So if I take the percent of A plus the percent of B, they must equal 100%. We could go through and show all of that calculation. We get the percent of B equaling 30... Right? And we could now drop that in here as 39.89% times what? The mass of B, okay? And before I start writing that, that's usually where people get tripped up and go, oh, I don't know the mass of that one. Should you know the mass of that one? No, you're actually being asked to solve for it. So that is an unknown. So we could write X. Algebra, it's your friend. When I add all those things up, what must they then equal? Well, they would equal the weighted average. The weighted average for an individual element would be the atomic. atomic mass, which is found on the periodic table. Because you have the periodic table, you can pull that information off and now write that information down as 69.72. Is that information embedded in the question? It's kind of swept under the rug so that you don't see it. You're supposed to know it's there. Okay? This will happen a lot. You have to be able to recognize the tools at hand. Use the periodic table. It is your friend. There's a crap ton of answers embedded in it. Okay? And we'll talk about those maybe today. Wait, how did you get 69.7? When we add all of these up, what do these equal? It's the weighted average or the atomic mass. Okay, that's just what the formula means. It's getting the atomic mass. Where's the atomic mass found? On the periodic table. Because I know I'm looking at gallium, I look at gallium and it says the atomic mass is 69.72. There it is. I can drop it in and now attempt to solve for it. Okay. One thing I do want to mention on this, we can't really work with these percents embedded in there. So we have to remove that information, okay, or remove that coding. How do we remove that coding? Okay. There's two approaches. There's one that is moving a decimal. I don't recommend moving the decimal. I recommend actually using what the term means. Per cent means per hundred. Now you don't have to worry about which way do I move the decimal because, yes, that can be a problem. You just enter it into the calculator. Make sense? Okay, sort of, well, it's a, definitely a tangent, whatever. Moving decimals, you hear them mentioned all the time, oh, King Henry's chocolate milk was purple and that's why he died. Whatever the stupid statement is. If you don't know, if that makes no sense to you, good. If that makes remote sense to you, you stop using it. It's about shifting decimal points and powers. Of, it, I don't understand it, okay? The biggest problem I have with that is that which way do you shift the decimal point depends on the system that you're working in and you may find that you're shifting it the wrong way. Understand the meaning behind what's happening, not some meaningless sequence of acronymical nonsense. You can tell how well I've memorized it. It does start with King Henry. Anybody was like, I roughly know what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, what was it? King? I wasn't that far off. King Henry died drinking chocolate milk. While, oh, what? Oh, let's just stop. Okay. We just don't need that anymore. Okay. Why were those systems invented? Okay, so different question. Anybody have a calculator in this room? Everybody should raise their hand because everybody has what in their pocket? A phone, which has a calculator. Why were those systems invented? Because you didn't have calculators to do the calculation for you. You have a freaking calculator. We don't need to memorize a bunch of useless mnemonic devices because the calculator will do it for you. Like thresholds of angriness, this is one of them. Like that puts me up there. Kind of makes sense? If you want to memorize them, that's fine. Okay. I, I don't really hold a grudge, per se, against you. It's the process. Okay? So, that takes us out of... That was ultimately actually in Chapter 2, but out of Chapter 4, Chapter 2, and jumping up to the periodic table.
right? So we went through the first half of chapter four, and now we go into the first half of chapter five. When we talk about the periodic table, most people go, oh, well, it's just the thing on the wall. What are these? These are also periodic tables. Why do we not have these plastered on the wall? They aren't even necessarily outdated. In fact, I think this one is probably newer than that periodic. Well, officially not because of all the stupid ones they added at the bottom. Right? It's tougher to read. Really? Which is the most abundant element on the periodic table on the wall? If we look at the periodic table up here, you notice those weird, goofy, trippy shapes? What do those weird, goofy, trippy shapes represent? The abundance. the abundance of the elements. By using the weird, goofy shapes, I can now predict different information. Right? We don't use those because we've decided the ones on the wall get us the bulk information that we want access to at our fingertips. I probably don't need to know about percent abundance relative to other isotopes. Right? So they all represent the same information and perhaps a little bit more in slightly different fashions, giving us access to different ways to interpret it. Make sense? The biggest point I want you to get out of this is the periodic table has a crap ton of information dumped into it, and it's not just the letters and numbers. It's also how those things are organized and where they are grouped. You have to acknowledge that information. And that information comes with a history of defining things. Okay? Stress less about the names on here, more just kind of about the interesting things behind it. We look at 1829. Dob Reiner goes through and says, elements are organized by triads. Why would he say triads? What is a triad? Three. Groups of three. Why would he pick groups of three? I can give you two explanations. One is probably made up entirely, but... How many elements did he have at that time? Oh. A whole lot less, which meant he could probably group things according to threes because he hadn't found most of the elements to be able to group them. Okay. The other one, are threes kind of important concepts in human cultures? Mm -hmm. Father, Son, Holy Ghost? You're like, oh, that's a load of crap. Scientists are just as manipulated by religion as everybody else. They're looking for patterns wherever they can find them. Right? If there's a pattern from the Bible, let's pull a pattern into chemistry. Because who created everything? God. Well, if God created everything, you better have the same patterns everywhere through it. Okay? So we will try to find those patterns. It's the human brain. It's what we do. Okay? As we continue to propagate through history, we get Newlands. Because we now get 62 elements. And he grouped them according to groups of seven okay? with atomic mass. His theory got called the law of octaves. Because do, 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 do. that's the best I can do. Octaves. Eight. And do, do, do. Eight. Yes. Notes in music. Or really it's seven notes in music and then it would be. It doesn't make sense to me because seven and eight doesn't line up. But whatever. It's tied back to music. So again, what are we doing? We're finding patterns where we have them. There's patterns in music of sets of seven. Hey, what do we got? Here's the law of octaves. The periodic table must be organized according to music theory. Okay? We're trying to pick up those patterns. Okay? This all gets kind of monkey-wrenched and played around with until we get Mendeleev. Mendeleev goes through and comes up with his own rules, organizes according to atomic mass, which I want to address right now. Wrong. Okay? But the kind of big reason why we go to Mendeleev for his periodic table is these magic little things called ekas. What are those ekas? Missing element. A missing element. So when he built the periodic table, he was like, it should go boron, aluminum, something, something, yttrium. I don't know what something, something is, but you jackholes out there finding things, you didn't find one yet. There's supposed to be something there. Right? That in and of itself isn't that big a deal. What makes it an even bigger deal is not only did you say you're missing, you didn't find it. He's saying this is what it looks like. This is what it weighs. This is how it behaves. Really? 
That's why the organization of our periodic table is pretty dang cool. Okay? That's why we give him a lot of credit. Okay? One of the other things that doesn't really get discussed about, he had lots of other suggestions about other things and predictions. And they were all horribly wrong. Okay? But we point out the awesomeness of some of those predictions, and that's what really sticks. He's also a really crazy, bizarre guy that's an interesting history read if you wanted to. Of course, Russian, because okay. all Russians are weird history reads, right? So let's take a look at this, okay? Eka silicon. So Eka silicon later became known as germanium. If we take a look at silicon, here's silicon, there's germanium right underneath it. So when he went through and predicted it, he said something is there, kind of like silicon, but different. Here's what it should look like. It should look gray. Has anybody looked at a picture of all the elements? Yeah, look it up. Feel free to. Periodic table, just pictures of all the elements. They're all freaking gray. Not a big deal. It weighs 72. Okay. Can't exactly just see that, so that's kind of interesting. It's density. So not only its weight, but I also know the relationship between its weight and its volume. It's this. You're starting to kind of creep me out a little bit that you're figuring this out. Melting point, very high. Eh, we aren't all perfect. This is how it reacts with oxygen. Its density, when it reacts with oxygen, it is going to weigh this much in this much volume. Seriously? How it reacts with chlorides, boiling points. 20 years later, ballpark, so someone comes up to you and says, in 20 years, you're going to weigh this much, you're going to have this percentage body fat, and your hair color will be this. Be like, I don't change my hair color all that much. Your hair all falls out. What are you going to say to that person? You're crazy. 20 years, what happened? Take a look at those freaking similarities. That's pretty nuts. That's why we remember Mendeleev. It is those predictive powers. Okay? Again, crazy guy. The organization behind his periodic table allegedly came to him in a dream. This is why it's okay to sleep through my class. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm sure he just made that up. As we continue through history, we get the noble gases. The noble gases are harder to find. Why might the noble gases be harder to find? They don't react well. They don't react well. That's why we call them noble. How many of you are the nobility? Fascinating. Why is it a question that everybody says, no, we're not the nobility to in this classroom? You were part of the nobility. How many other people would be in your classroom? None. You pay someone to privately teach you all that. Or you pay somebody to make you look, think people think you know that. Okay? So all the noble gases don't react with anything, so they're very hard to isolate. They are eventually isolated. Ramsey's the one that gets the most credit for them. Once we found one, they all kind of came out because we found a process to do it. Mosley is where we get up the nuclear charge. Okay, what is the charge on an individual nucleus? And then he says, well, actually, Mendeleev, I know you like to organizing things by atomic mass, but it actually makes more sense to go by the atomic number or the nuclear charge, how many protons are present. Right? And if you go through and look at the periodic table and compare atomic number all the way through versus atomic mass, all the way through, you will see they do grow. They get increasingly larger as we move through the periodic table. There are very few exceptions, okay? but that's how it's organized for the most part. Okay? Our periodic law is referencing that it always goes by atomic number. Okay? Niels Bohr, end of chapter four, that's going to be the big beast next week. Okay? We get the final organization of our periodic table that actually draws information in about electrons. So knowing where and how electrons exist within an atom is embedded within the periodic table. I would love to continue talking, but based off of the excitement of everybody putting their stuff away, I think we're done with class.